right. Okay. Welcome, everyone, here and especially online. Um, there's many more people uh, attending this talk online than there are here physically. I don't know if you can, you can see us, probably just a bit of us. Um, anyway, welcome wherever you are. Um, we're happy to see you. Um, and welcome especially to our speaker, uh, Deborah Lysett, professor and dietitian. Um, before we introduce her to you, um, um, I'm just going to say a few words uh, about the context of this talk and um, announce a few practicalities. So this is the, um, the third lecture of the fourth annual Health Humanities Lecture Series uh, at KU Leuven. Uh, it's organized by the uh, Leuven Center for Health Humanities. Um, and uh, I'm very happy to say that we are now officially um, an interfaculty, interdisciplinary research center uh, in the, the, uh, within the group of humanities and social sciences at KU Leuven. Uh, and what we hope to do with this lecture series uh, and with all the ac other activities that we organize, uh, research, seminar, and so on, is to bring together scholars from uh, different disciplines, areas, groups of uh, sciences, including, of course, medicine. Uh, um, so that's what we aim to do. And the, the main sort of overarching theme of this year's uh, lecture series is patient agency. Uh, I don't know if you, you, you read that somewhere, maybe in one of the emails. So patient agency is a bit of a sort of seeming contradiction, you could say. Uh, so the, 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 I mean, to be a patient seems to imply that you're being passive, to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, as Hamlet had it. But that's not the whole story. And what we try to sort of uh, um, put uh, central in this uh, in this series is that patients also have the capacity to act in various ways, to dispute medical knowledge and therapies, to form patient organizations, uh, and generally to make sense of their situation. So um, all of the, the this year's speakers will focus on uh, some theme that's related to patient agency. And today we have uh, Deborah talking about uh, uh, patient agency and obesity. Next month, uh, we have philosopher Lisa Bortolotti. Uh, she will talk about epistemic agency in mental health care for young people. Um, in April, we have a historian, Ilva Söderfeld, to talk about patient organizations um, and how patient organizations have contributed to medicine. And then finally, in May, we have literary theorist and neurodiversity expert Anna Stenning uh, to talk about uh, narrative agency and autism. And so you're very welcome to all of these uh, talks. Uh, of course, I noticed that many of you have already registered for uh, some of the other talks as well. So that's the context. I'll try to be as brief as I can. And then a few practicalities. Um, so as in the previous year, um, we have, uh, we're very grateful to have um, some of our own language students interpreting this lecture from English to Dutch. So if you uh, are interested in following this lecture in uh, Dutch, then please go to the bottom of your page, uh, the Zoom page. It has a, a button that says interpretation next to reactions. If you click on uh, interpretation, you can switch between English and German. Well, there's no German, but it's Dutch. Uh, German is Dutch here. So mind you, uh, um, uh, you know, expectations and all that. But uh, there's no option Dutch. So in the, there's, apparently there's an update of Zoom now that includes Dutch. But for, some, for now, we have to go with German. Um, so you're free to switch there if you, if you want to. And thanks again for the interpretation student uh, for doing this. Um, now, I should tell you that today's talk, but not the Q and A, will be recorded, uh, as usual, uh, because we publish all the uh, the talks in our series on the uh, Health Humanities playlist of the KU Leuven YouTube channel. Um, I'll put the um, the link in the slide in the chat, so you can uh, uh, you know uh, forward it to people uh, that could probably uh, perhaps be interested. Now, time-wise, we have an hour in and a half in total, well, an hour and 20 minutes. Uh, okay. And Deborah kindly agreed to limit the talk to uh, say 45 or 50 minutes or so, which means we have plenty of time for Q&A. Um, and well, it's a bit complicated, of course, because we're in a hybrid setting, but um, well, it's fairly easy. I'll walk around here with the microphone. So if you have a question here, I can just give you the microphone, just speak up 
uh, really well that the interpreters can hear you and translate it to, to Dutch. Um, and for those who are following online, uh, it's very easy. Just send me, um, that's Peter Adriaans, um, the host, uh, send me a chat message, a private message, maybe to everyone, I, I don't care. Uh, so I can, I can sort of make a list of people who want to ask a question. And uh, when it's your turn, I'll just, you know, point at you, just send you a message to warn you that you're up next, okay? Uh, if, if you want, for some reason, me to read your question out loud, I'll, I'll be happy to do that too, if that makes you uh, more comfortable. In that case, you have to write out your question, of course. So... At the end of this session, I'll post a link also in the chat to a very brief questionnaire about the lecture. Uh, it's, it's totally anonymous and it takes a really, really uh, short time to fill in. It's just a minute or so. And you make us very happy if you fill it out. Um, uh, it's you know, an administrative thing, but it's, it's important for us. Um, it's a bit of an evaluation of this, this talk. Uh, and then finally, remember of course, to switch off your microphone and looking at people online, uh, switch off your microphone at all times, except, except of course, if you're asking a question, the thing is we can hear you quite clearly here. Um, so please switch off your microphone now. I'll monitor this as well a little bit, um, but voila, there we go. Sorry for the, the lengthy introduction, all the practicalities, you know, uh, technology comes with uh, brand new options, but also complications, um, but uh, Right, I am now give the floor to Anami uh, Dillon, uh, a colleague at Theology. Uh, she helped us, uh, kindly helped us to organize uh, this uh, lecture. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll ask her to introduce our speaker today. Thank you. So I'm very happy that I can present, um, introduce Professor Lyset. So, she is uh, related to Coventry University in the UK and huh? being a professor there and a director of the Center for Intelligent Healthcare, which is an interdisciplinary center. She's chairing it and there are many people from many disciplines related to that uh, center. She also holds a personal chair in religious health interventions and dietetic practice. And so she's very famous for her application of the biopsychosocial spiritual model uh, of health in the context of um, diabetes, nutrition, related conditions, dietary, and so on. So today she will talk to us about agency uh, as it's the topic of this um, series of lectures and she will present some of her empirical research, well, the research of her and her team, of course, and the empirical uh, research about a practical model um, they are implying huh, in, in uh, healthcare and especially in um, dietary or dietetic consultancy practices. So. I'm very happy that our speaker is a practitioner on the one hand and a, a professor, someone with a high academic reputation too. And I'm also very happy that our audience today has the same variety. So we have students, we have practitioners um, from the field of chaplaincy and um, theology, pastoral care, but also from uh, the field of um, dietary and so on. So, um, yeah, I think that's it for now. There's probably much more to say, but we'll learn about your own practice and your own research by listening to. So you have the floor. Thank you. Thanks for the introduction. And it's so good to be here. Can I just check everybody on Zoom can actually hear? Is that oh, are we getting good response from that? Yeah, great, great. So, um, so yeah, it's, it's a privilege to be here and thank you for, for hosting me and for all the hospitality you've shown me. So, um, yes, I'm going to talk about uh, patient agency, um, but uh, kind of in, a, in the context of the biopsychosocial spiritual model of health. Um, and I'll, I'll go through uh, various models and then I'll talk about how we actually have applied it 
um, in, in practice and in our research. So um, just to kind of give you a bit of an outline as to um, where I'm going with this, I'm going to mention a little bit about the perspectives I bring because, um, you know, uh, uh, it is a, a multidisciplinary perspective, really. Um, and then I'm going to talk about patient, patient agency in various health models and uh, models of behaviour change as well. And then consider whether possibly uh, we've gone too far with patient agency um, and consider that in the context of obesity and uh, think about some of the, the research we've done in there. And if we've had, if I have a bit of time left over, I will talk about some of the other projects. So um, just in terms of uh, the kind of perspectives I bring, um, this is sort of my multidisciplinary circle in terms of where I've come from. Um, so I had a, a clinical background as uh, in clinical nutrition as a dietitian um, in the National Health Service in the UK. Um, and I very much preferred the sort of academic side of things. So I went into an academic career and did a PhD in behavioral medicine. Um, and that covered a lot of uh, sort of health psychology um, within that field. And um, that PhD took me into uh, thinking about uh, sort of addiction because it was in tobacco addiction and weight gain and particularly thinking about when people stop smoking, um, the implications that has on, on weight. And um, alongside that sort of field of addiction, I was introduced really to, to the academic field of uh, religion, spirituality and health. Um, and I guess that a clear link there is through the 12 step programs where um, uh, spirituality is something that is considered um, important in, in treating addictions. So um, I come from those sort of academic areas in terms of uh, clinical background and then behavioral medicine and then sort of religion, spirituality and health. And in terms of my uh, actual research uh, sort of uh, methods, um, I have, uh, you know, background both in quantitative and qualitative uh, research. So do uh, clinical trials, uh, epidemiology, as well as kind of mixed methods, finding out about patient experience. Um, and, and kind of co-production as well. And our centre is very keen on co-production in all the work that it does so that we're doing things uh, with and for not to um, individuals. And then very latterly, I guess, I've moved into the digital arena, which is why it's a little bit uh, out there, but that will become clear as I go through. So um, I would say as I've journeyed through my career, um, my work and interest has become much more patient focused and I'll, I'll use the term patient because we're talking about patient agency but you know we can use the term client or individual um, but but yes I would say that the patient has become much more at the fore and the practitioner much less um, much less so and to me this is what kind of patient agency is all about really it's um, who is in the driving seat and, uh, and so that's the kind of perspective that I'm coming, coming at. And that it's a journey into compassionate care. It's about kind of considering what the patient needs are, the patient at the center of, of care, um, rather than, than being done to by a clinician. But it wasn't always that way. So if we think back to the biomedical bio model, um, you know, that was very much embedded in healthcare. And in my early days in uh, clinical practice, I was probably most aligned to this, where you kind of look for something to correct, whether it's a nutritional uh, deficiency or whether um, you need to kind of prescribe nutrients to fix that or uh, tell people what to eat in order to improve their health. So um, it was very much the kind of practitioner as the expert um, and with that sort of paternalistic power our dynamic with um, you know the patient as the receiver really um, and as Peter actually already mentioned about the word patient you know that there is from the biomedical model the concept that patients are kind of quite helpless and dependent um, and although in some situations that is the case, I worked in intensive care units um, where people are ventilated and sedated and, and um, you know, obviously the, the autonomy isn't there, but then you have to in, include the family in that and in, in the decision making. 
But I would say that really the biomedical model came undone when we started to see that um, there was a lack of treatment effect in ABLE patients. Um, and that was considered non-compliance, but it's now been changed to non-adherence, but I think that's still quite judgmental. Um, and, uh, and, and kind of a, an element of them doing, not doing what they're told or not doing what's right for them. And, and why is that? And so that was really the beginnings of the biopsychosocial model of health. Okay, great. So you can still hear me. Um, and so uh, the recognition then uh, with the role of uh, psychological and social factors um, playing a, a key role in health and disease. And really, it, it's so obvious, you just need to think about kind of gut health and think about, um, you know, if you're, if you're stressed, what happens to your gut? Um, and also think about, uh, you know, cardiovascular disease as well and stress in relation to hypertension and risk of cardiovascular disease. So it's quite obvious really that you know so many more um, psychological and, and social things um, impact um, on our health. Um, and then like I said the model was actually very important in sort of helping us understand why people didn't kind of follow health advice um, and it became particularly um, important in developing health behavior change theories helping to answer that question. Um, So um, I'll just briefly mention um, a couple of theories of behavior change, if you're not familiar with them already. I'm sure some of you are. Um, but I just want to mention them in the context of patient agency, because I think this is quite an interesting way to look at them, um, because they, as the models develop, there seems to be uh, an increase in patient autonomy and patient responsibility alongside that. Um, and just to start off here, you can see that the um, social cognitive theory, uh, which is, a, a, again, a theory of behavior change, um, was really about what are the, the individual factors in a person and what are the environmental factors and social factors that actually all come into play to have an impact and a change on behavior. And when I talk about behavior, I'm primarily talking about health behavior. And then um, quite a, a key theory that probably came out of um, the biopsychosocial model of health is uh, the health belief model, where um, there is that kind of balance of, well, will you act on, on some uh, health advice is dependent on whether you perceive it personally to be a threat or you perceive it to, um, to kind of be something that's worthwhile and beneficial to do. So the balance of kind of risk and harm on a personal level is something that um, very much uh, sort of underpinned the health belief model. Um, and then that kind of developed further. So rather than just being about our attitude towards behavior, um, the incorporation of social aspects, what is a social norm, what is the expectation of society, all that played a big role. Um, and then also control and perceived control of the behavior um, was important. And Later on, um, there was added to that things like self-efficacy and experience in terms of past behavior. And all those things would play in to um, what a behavioral intention to change health behavior is. Um, and then there was really the assumption that if your intention to change behavior um, is, is all in the right direction, then your behavior will change. But actually, I'm sure we can all think of situations where we've intended to do the best thing, you know, with the best intentions, and actually then nothing does change. So um, no model really uh, kind of accurately predicts health behavior all the time. Um, and there's lots of these models and the ones that I've showed you have, are actually kind of based on rational thought um, and don't really take into account the um, effect of habit and emotion and instinct. And of course, lots of health behavior is a result of kind of uh, 
um, instinct or, or, or emotion or, um, or habit, things like smoking and um, alcohol use. So um, the, those models have all been better at predicting the intention to behave rather than the actual behavior. Um, and, uh, but a, a more recent theory has been the prime theory of motivation. Um, and uh, I worked with uh, Robert West who developed um, this when I was doing my um, PhD. And this is around considering really, um, as well as a reflective or a cognitive uh, sort of reasoned approach to, um, to health, an automatic one, which is just an in the moment impulse. And that is actually very important in terms of things like addiction and smoking and alcohol, um, particularly if your brain chemistry um, is, is kind of creating urges that, you know, you're in withdrawal from nicotine. So you need to have um, the, the, the nicotine back through a, a cigarette or whatever. Um, you know, those impulses tend to override reason in the moment. So um, there's a lot more um, around, around that and around tackling impulse um, and, and helping people to have everything or the resources they need to, to make good behavior changes um, rather than just know what to do and think it's a good idea. Um, and you can read more about the, the prime theory of uh, motivation there, but um, as you can see, it's not just about the plans and intentions, but also the impulses. Now, I don't know whether um, you're familiar with the phrase in, in Belgium, but we often talk in, in England about you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. So um, that's effectively what, what we're, we're saying. Uh, so, so how do you get a horse to drink? Well, you might recognize some of these sort of uh, uh, ideas as things that we've done in public health campaigns. We've done training, we've done incentivization, we've done um, you know, regulations. I mean, smoking is a classic for thinking about government reg regulations. Um, and so we, we've created everything that's, that's there to support individuals to change. But actually, what, what is the key thing? So how, how do you get a horse to drink? Well, first of all, you need to make it thirsty. So it needs to have that need. But ultimately, it's about it has to want it. So, you know, if you, if you can lead a horse to beer, then uh, as this picture shows, it might be more likely to, to drink it. Um, but, uh, you know, joking aside, it is really down to, you know, an individual kind of uh, preferences and, and wants and likes and, and feelings in the moment that drive a lot of behavior. Um, and that is something that um, only up, up until recently has, has come to light. So um, from kind of these emerging models of health that, that I've shown you, I think we can see that it's kind of gone very much from instruction to, re to reasoning and then to con consideration of a more individual level, an individual's history, um, their circumstances, and ultimately their choice. And um, I think this is particularly aligned with that uh, developing level of patient agency. Um, you know, the, the two kind of are, are mirrored in terms of how we've um, uh, created uh, more patient agency and patient-centered care and much more holistic care, all of which um, is very good. And also alongside this, there's been a lot of, um, if, if you kind of increase patient agency, then you know, you're increasing their responsibility in terms of the responsibility they take for their health. And a lot of this has resulted in successful kind of self-management programs for long-term conditions and, um, and very much kind of empowering individuals to, to take control of their health. And, you know, that is all good, um, but I will uh, come on shortly to, to talk about um, whether we've perhaps taken things a little bit too far. But before I do, I'm just going to um, talk about one last model, which is the model that um, my work is now very much focused around, which is the biopsychosocial spiritual model of health. So it's adding this spiritual dimension. And... Uh, this was um, quite well summarized um, in some of the people who, who developed this. And Salma say actually does this quote um, and you can read it there, but it's 
pretty much about kind of including the trans transcendental. Um, and, and what do we mean by that? Because transcendence can't actually be measured. So we're not looking to, to kind of um, measure the, the existence of God or anything like that. But we can measure a patient's uh, religiosity, their engagement with spiritual activities, their spiritual well-being and their spiritual needs. But why would we want to do that? What, why does that have um, an impact on health? Well, there is a whole body of literature, and I'm just going to um, mention a, a few uh, reviews that kind of show you um, the impact um, and the evidence that we've got around um, the impact of religion, spirituality on mental health. This was a review by Harold Koning in um, 2009. Um, just and it was um, it's a review of observational studies, so you can't kind of prove cause and effect, but it did suggest the association was with better mental health in those who engaged with um, religious or spiritual practices. And what I'm talking about here in terms of um, religious or spiritual practices is kind of normative um, behavior that you'd expect in society related to religion and spirituality. I'm not talking about um, kind of, uh, you know, religious delusions, which are, are clearly a, um, a disease state. And that is, that is quite separate. Um, you know, a lot of this work has been studied in psychiatry and the interest has been there because, um, you know, that there are religious delusions that present in psychosis. Um, but we're not talking about psychosis here. We're talking about a normative um, kind of uh, religious or, or spiritual practice. And I think it's important to make that, that distinction. And then um, just in terms of longevity, there's also lots of studies that, that uh, suggest that uh, religious involvement is associated with uh, living a little bit longer. So again, we can't prove cause and effect, but interesting associations. And then physical disease as well. And this is just an example from cardiovascular disease um, and looking at um, uh, improved inflammatory markers, impl improved cardiovascular function in terms of heart rate and uh, a reduction in stress hormones. And some of that might be to do with lifestyle factors. For example, generally those who are more religious are going to be less likely to smoke. So that's an, an obvious um, uh, thing there. But that might also be a mediation through um, an improvement in mental well-being and through that kind of reduction in stress. Um, and that's that's uh, shown here in, in this, this model. Um, where you can see that mental health and the impact of mental health leads into physical health. And that's through what we call a, a psychoneuroimmunological pathway, where um, the changes in, in the brain um, lead on to, to physical changes and, and disease states. I, this is a, a rather old version of the model, and I've taken the liberty of kind of extending the circle of spirituality there so that spirituality isn't just with religion at the core, but also um, embraces a secular spirituality. Because I think for a lot of people, um, spirituality is, is not just based on, on religion, but is based on, on uh, things outside of religion. And there's been lots of, um, you know, discussions about uh, the definitions of what, what is religion, what is spirituality, which I won't go into. I'll leave that to my theological colleagues. But um, I, I would just sort of suggest that spirituality is really about ultimate meaning and purpose. Um, and would like to make the distinction that um, for some, that's found within religion. So I would call that a religious spirituality and for others that's a non-religious or a secular spirituality and I think that's quite helpful for people to see that um, spirituality is, can be thought of in, in those camps. Um, and then I would suggest as well that perhaps more importantly in health than kind of what someone's religion or someone's spirituality is, is actually um, their religious coping mechanisms and whether they have spiritual struggles. Um, and this is a model here, which shows that positive religious coping, so where people are kind of, um, you know, 
aligned with, with their beliefs and are using them in a positive way can help to reduce the stress and then have an impact on, on physical health. But the negative religious coping where people are perhaps in conflict um, with, you know, what their beliefs or what they thought they believed and what's happening now. Um, and also spiritual struggles, you know, if somebody is ill, they might think, well, why did, why did God let this happen? Um, or, uh, you know, what, what's going on? I've led a good life or why have I got this diagnosis? So all those sorts of things represent a spiritual struggle, which can have an impact on stress and then an impact on physical symptoms as well. So this is just a definition, um, X-Line in the US, Julie X-Line is uh, very uh, prominent in the field around spiritual struggles, um, and they can come in in various forms. Um, and then we can see as well from a sort of uh, more observational study literature that positive, spiritual struggles where there is a high level of spiritual struggles they are generally more associated with um, poor mental health um, whereas um, they, they're also associated with um, you know poor life satisfaction and re reduction in happiness as well and that's to contrast to the fact that positive religious coping has this association with improved mental well-being So what, what about patient agency in this model then? So um, I think for many, religion and spirituality is fundamental to their identity and their decision making. So I think it's something that we can't leave out. I think it's something that we can't assume that is um, important to everybody, but it's something that we need to consider because it does affect so many people. And um, I've put there at the center of this model, person-centered healthcare. So all of this must be around the patient or the person right at the middle, and it must be driven by that individual. It's not about the kind of belief of the practitioner, but it's about uh, where is the patient at? Um, are they, have they got resources that they can find helpful? Are they struggling to um, make sense, make some meaning of something that's happening to them that they would appreciate um, perhaps some, some more uh, spiritual discussion around? So um, in an article that I, I recently wrote around um, bringing spiritual care into uh, dietetic practice and, and consultancy, I, um, I've made the quote that inquiring whether a patient has a religious or a spiritual belief that might be helpful or causing them concern is neither threatening nor coercive. Because it's, it's something you can ask a question and it's something that um, has to be patient led. If you ask the question, is religion or spirituality important to you? And the patient says, no, that's it. No more conversation. But if they say, oh yeah, you know, I, I'm just wondering why this has happened to me, then that raises kind of an existential issue that they could perhaps uh, be helped by uh, talking that through. So we're encouraging uh, much more engage engagement in chaplaincy um, through all health professionals um, to kind of consider that there might be some, some things that are raised and some, uh, some uh, sort of prompts that they can look out for that suggest a spiritual struggle. Um, and then, yeah, I've mentioned this, obviously, it's not about um, coercing individuals or not about a clinician's belief. And that's really important because despite what we say about kind of patient agency, there is still uh, quite a dynamic power dynamic in a consultation room. And it's very important that that isn't abused or uh, clinicians values and views aren't put onto a patient uh, because of that, because that would obviously be unethical. Okay, so as promised, I'm just going to uh, talk for a few minutes about what about whether we've taken patient agency too far? So I've talked about, um, you know, patient agency kind of increases where the responsibility for health lies. But with that, there becomes 
you know, what, what, when that, what happens when that goes wrong? Who's to blame? And there becomes a sense that people start to blame themselves when things go wrong with their health. Um, yes, they, they blame, um, you know, their health system and they play, blame, blame the professionals, but actually there's a lot of underlying guilt there as well. And particularly around sort of some public health messaging, um, I wonder as well is, have we been rather overzealous in some of that? I mean, when you think about um, public health messaging, I mean, it's good that we eat healthily, but when that message kind of ends up with parents in such a state around, well, I can't give my child a chocolate bar, you kind of think, have things gone a little bit too far? Um, and, and what is that doing for the mental health, not only of the parent, but the child as well? Um, so um, I think through, through perhaps um, unwittingly perhaps taking page, patient agency too far, we have created some guilt, some shame, and alongside that goes stigma and fear. And this is particularly seen with obesity and obesity stigma, and I'll talk about that in a moment. But with all these negative emotions, we end up with uh, worse, the worst health outcomes, the very things that we were trying to improve at the start, we are now kind of affecting. So I would urge that we all consider, you know, what, what is the balance of these things? I think, I think the danger always comes when we have very polarized views. And I think that there is that, that middle road where we can take the good um, and, and take the good from lots of different disciplines um, and, and not sort of have to be completely polarized about things because the balance often lies somewhere in the middle. Um, so yeah, so, so that's the, the kind of, have we sort of uh, overburdened patients, I guess, with an impossible perfection was what, what I wanted to raise here. And then um, in the context of obesity as an example, um, this report is quite old now, but it, it hasn't been updated and it was quite key at the time. But this um, talks about all the reasons why somebody might be struggling with obesity. And it uh, takes away very much from this simplistic view that energy intake um, exceeds energy expenditure and that results in weight gain. Of course, fundamentally at the scientific level, that is true. But what are all the causes that people end up having more intake than they are using up in terms of energy output? And just to give you an idea of the complexity, this is an attempt that was done in that report to map all the causes of obesity. And um, the thick lines are showing where there is stronger evidence um, and the thinner lines where there is less evidence. Um, and you can see that, I mean, you might not be able to see uh, some of the smaller detail there, but there's biological reasons, there's neurological reasons, there's um, influence of early life, of adverse childhood events, an obesogenic environment, economic factors, negative emotions. You know, it's huge. So um, we need to kind of think about uh, all these factors are involved um, and it's, it's not just a simple thing that somebody can, um, can uh, sort of control their way in an easy way. And this quote um, by Rand in uh, 2017, who did a multi-level um, analysis of people, qualitative analysis of people living with obesity, just shows really how blamed uh, people can feel. And I'll just let you read that for a moment. So that might be, um, you know, they're talking about uh, family members and friends there. But um, is it perhaps more concerning that this is uh, about health professionals? And this is a, a quote that kind of summed that up. And, you know, I think this is where health professionals need to consider all the wider dynamics of holistic care that are involved. Um, because if, if they're trying to kind of 
uh, address a weight problem is actually making the weight problem worse than there's something going wrong. Um, and, you know, the health professional in this situation would probably have no idea that that's how that patient was feeling. Um, but it is, it is quite strong words. So in terms of obesity, then, I think we need to have this compassionate approach to obesity and really consider obesity much more as a relapsing and remitting condition rather than something that you can just eat less, exercise more, and then all is well. Because in reality, that's not what happens. In reality, people go through um, uh, periods of weight loss, periods of weight regain. There's a lot of um, a psychological um, in, uh, sort of association with that when people gain the weight that they thought they'd lost. Even when people have had um, bariatric surgery, years later, they are back at the weight management clinics starting the cycle again. So there is a lot going on which isn't easily sorted. So um, one of the, the ways that um, we, we've kind of looked at tackling that is considering more health-focused rather than weight loss-focused approaches to, um, uh, to, to managing weight. Um, so these health, not weight loss programs are really kind of buying into the fact that sometimes dietary restriction can lead to maladaptive eating behavior. And they are based around intuitive eating. So getting back in rhythm with the body's natural appetite. Um, and the ethos is very much about improving well-being first and then enabling uh, weight control to follow more naturally. And it's a more compassionate and stable approach to weight management. But does it work? It's controversial. If somebody wants to lose weight and um, you give them unconditional permission to eat, that, that kind of goes against the grain. So we did, a couple of years ago now, we did a systematic review looking at um, all the randomized controlled trials that had taken this approach compared to conventional weight loss um, approaches. And although weight was lost much quicker and much more significantly in the short term, the long-term outcomes about a year later were no different, no different for cardiovascular risk or, uh, or body weight. Um, and what we did find that the, um, some of the disordered eating behaviors were actually significantly better. Um, but like, like all things, you know, it's limited by the research that's out there. And, and so it wasn't, it wasn't of the highest quality. Um, or, you know, there, there were some biases within some of, some of the studies that we included in the review. But nonetheless, it kind of gave us an encouragement to kind of say, well, this doesn't seem to really be doing any harm. So we then built on from that because we considered that it didn't embrace the whole psychosocial spiritual model and that something else was missing. Um, and this was based on the evidence around some of um, sort of spiritual or religious uh, aspects of eating. And you can see there, I've just uh, put in some, um, some references of some studies that have shown that emotional eating um, is worse when spiritual well-being is worse. Um, and also even, uh, it says even here, even among those who aren't religious, um, they're receptive to a spiritual element. That was actually an Overeaters Anonymous 12-step uh, program that that came from. There have also been, um, you know, body uh, concerns and binge eating has been seen to be associated with divine struggles, in particular anger at God. And that's not only people who, um, people in this particular study uh, that X-Line had, um, people were rating it that they were angry in God at God, even though they didn't believe in God. So, so maybe they were angry at the idea of God. So, so there's lots of things going on um, and it's, it's much more complicated, but it's interesting that that was associated with uh, sort of more disordered eating. 
Um, and then in the UK, which kind of has led to the program Taste and See that I'll talk about in a moment, um, uh, we found that those who were particularly uh, related, uh, affiliated to a Christian religion had a higher BMI, so more likely to be overweight, which meant that, um, you know, it, it might be a good opportunity there to, to kind of um, help with a, a Christian focused weight uh, sort of management program. So this is Taste and See, which is, uh, we're running a randomized control trial, which has just finished. We've just finished two year follow-up data. So I've got a big spreadsheet waiting to be analyzed, um, but I'll talk a little bit about uh, some of the early results. But just to give you the idea of the concept is that this was designed to tackle a weight, a weight gain, weight, a weight loss um, cycle where people go into dietary restriction, they go on a diet, they find that difficult to sustain. So they then, um, oh, not pressing the right thing. They then feel quite guilty about it. Um, and then those negative feelings often end up resulting in more overeating. And so the cycle go, goes on. And then um, from an intuitive eating perspective, we um, overlaid that with um, these four principles of intuitive eating to try and break the cycle at each of these points. And you can see that how, how that, that could potentially do that. And then we added the unique um, spiritual element based on uh, Christian spirituality. And we talked about Christian principles of freedom in terms of uh, freedom from, from, from guilt. Um, and, uh, but also that in your freedom, the exercise of responsibility. Um, and then we talked about uh, tackling sort of guilt and shame and um, self-acceptance around kind of viewing uh, yourself as God might see you. And then exploring uh, some of uh, sort of meeting of spiritual needs to tackle some of some of the emotional needs as well. So that was that was what uh, Taste and See was based on. And these are, in short, just some of the results from the early feasibility study. Um, I don't know if you can, can see the figures that well, but basically um, we found that, you know, it was feasible to conduct this within churches, that, um, uh, that communities, uh, volunteers could be trained up to do it, and that it resulted in, in weight loss and improved mental well-being, reduction in emotional eating and improved spiritual well-being. So that kind of led us on to um, the, the trial that we're, uh, we've since done. But, um, you know, the results are, are there in those references. We also asked people what they thought about that. And uh, there was a qualitative analysis that was done. And just very briefly, the, the, these were the kind of themes that came out. And I think perhaps the most interesting theme there was that this was in a Christian church where we kind of expected that um, people would involve God in all aspects of their lives. But actually, until this, they hadn't in their eating issues. And they had felt so ashamed of their eating that they had said, I can't talk to God about it. Um, and so we found that quite, quite surprising. Um, and, uh, and, and so that was, that was interesting to, to see that. And then as they went through the program, um, they began to use faith as a resource and realize that this was something that um, God could help them with. So again, you can read about the results there. So this is just some, some pictures uh, from a sort of taste and see. It's gone through many refinements over, over the time. It started off with a kind of pack where you've got a DVD and manuals and you, know, you could sort of take it off the shelf and run it in a small group within a church. Um, and uh, we developed it alongside a church so that it was kind of co-created. And uh, now we're at the point where um, it's been digitalized and it's a, in an online platform. And a lot of that was kind of uh, expedited by COVID really. So again, um, I'm sure you'll get a copy of these slides, but you can um, click on the websites to find out a little bit more about that. Um, and there's a little film that is um, a clip that tells you a bit more as well. Um, and the Cinnamon Network is a network that helps support churches who want to do social action in the UK. So we're a registered project with that. 
But I'll just uh, give you a little bit of a, a clip of what this digital intervention looks like. So when you join the digital intervention, you, you kind of get a sign and, and, and a login, and you might be able to see the small print there. It says it's powered by hope for the community. So one of the other um, key uh, researchers in, in my um, in my center is Andy Turner, and he's developed this um, hope platform, which is all positive psychology for coping with long term conditions. And really, people kind of journey through this program, and it's resulted in improvement in mental and um, yeah, yeah, mental well-being. It doesn't currently have a spiritual component, but we are in the process of doing that. And so we put Taste and See on this platform. Um, and it's a platform whereby, you know, people can monitor their progress, as you can see there. Uh, people can post and share hopes or, or prayers, whichever they, they want. You know, we're trying to keep it as open as possible. Um, people can watch teaching clips. They can also kind of set goals in which they would get, you know, alerts and reminders around, you know, goals that they'd set. That there's a gratitude wall, which is also a, a sort of thanks to God wall. And people can post on that, like has been done there. And people can, can, you know, read stuff on there. They can discuss in, in forums and um, they can reflect uh, as well. And then there are various sort of self-directed activities that they can do. So this is really the kind of content of the program that we had running in an individual um, situation where we, it was a group of people face to face now in an online um, format that you can join as individuals. And that the, there's, uh, we've got a free trial of that starting in March as well. So um, if people are interested, they can, they can join that from the website. So how much time have I got left? Five minutes. Five more minutes, that's perfect. So um, I'd just like to finish with mentioning a couple of other projects that, uh, that we have going on. Um, so the RIBS taxonomy, um, if any of you have been to the European Conference on Religion, Spirituality and Health, you'll have probably heard of this already. But this is about religious health interventions in behavioral sciences. And this is an attempt to kind of define and classify all the components that might be used, um, it, well, all the religious components that might be used in healthcare interventions. So it's not, it's not the health components, you know, it, they need to be in there as well, because, you know, it's not an either or. Um, but it's an attempt to be able to kind of have all the multidisciplines kind of talking the same language. You know, if um, if chaplains are doing something or if um, doctors are, are making a referral or, you know, that there is a, um, a discussion around, uh, uh, you know, an existential issue, then then what what does that actually mean and, and how is that defined? So this taxonomy has now been developed and it's under review for publication at the moment and it went through um, an international Delphi exercise so it's had a lot of international collaboration across Europe and the US um, and it also had usability testing so we have a sense of how it's worked as well. The other um, interesting uh, uh, just one last uh, project I'll mention that one of my PhD students is doing I mentioned the sort of 12-step programs and Alcoholics Anonymous well, um, if you haven't heard of Overeaters Anonymous, this is a 12 step program for those who struggle with overeating. And well, technically at a scientific level and at a, a, a kind of a psychiatric level, eating isn't an addiction. Individuals will feel they are addicted to food in some cases, and this is designed to help them. So this trial that we're doing is a randomized controlled trial um, in uh, dietetic clinics, weight management clinics in the UK, where we will be um, asking individuals whether they would be um, wanting to, to consider, you know, a spiritual um, aspect or an, and looking at an addictive aspect to eating and referring to that. So this is probably the first time that we've kind of actively tried to get, um, you know, this sort of into the, the normal consultation room, if you like. So we will we will see how that goes. It's just going through ethical approval at the moment, which um, is always a, a hard ask. 
<laughs> and then um, you can read all about the rest of my centre um, at that website. These are some of the theme leads. So Andy does a lot of digital self-management interventions. We have um, a theme which is much more socially focused around abuse and trauma and health and people with um, survivors of domestic violence and mental health. We have, you know, the, the hard qualitative quantitative stuff around epidemiology and statistics. Um, my area is obviously the public health and faith-based interventions. And then we have really complicated AI stuff as well and sensors and, and all that sort of thing. So we you can see we are very multidisciplinary, um, but I like to think we are holistic um, and that we all work together to um, make an impactful intervention um, for, for people's health and quality of life. And that's it. And if you want any references that I've listed, I, I can send those on, for, on to you.